All right. Shabbat shalom, everybody. Shabbat shalom. It's good to be back again. Uh, another beautiful Sabbath. So last week we talked a lot about uh, Sozo and the, uh, just kind of discussing how it's used and how that's different than uh, Zoe. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about so Sozo, but then we're going to get into, we're going we're to break into the concept of zo uh, Zoe. And this is kind of coming off of the, uh, the parable of the wedding feast and how, uh, we'll, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But just, uh, we're talking about the differences in uh, judgment, the differences in terms of uh, the you know, sal salvation itself. Like, is there, you know, different levels? Are there different levels uh, in this uh, kingdom of God? And uh, just going from there, and we're, that's what we're building off of. All of this is under the context of the bride needing to be wise and understanding uh, your inheritance. So with that, we're going to tackle a couple of, I would say, complicated verses uh, when taken by itself. So we're going to tackle those and kind of put it into a broader context and hopefully get a fuller picture of sozo. So if you remember, uh, sozo means to save or rescue or deliver. It can, uh, it can also be referred to as you know, to heal, to make well or whole. Uh, the concept is restoration, you know, making things, you know, putting things back the way that they should. Zoe, uh, Zoe is a little bit different. It's talking about, you know, life in its fullest. It's talking about vitality. It's talking about, you know, uh, it is the one way, so the, every living soul is, you know, is or has, you know, Zoe. It's, it's this animation, right? This being able to move around. This is uh, zoe in one sense, but it also has a, uh, another meaning. It's referring to like after the resurrection in eternal life. And different authors use these words, and there are other words that are translated as salvation. Um, we talked about one last week, uh, soteria. I, I forget how to pronounce that word. Uh, but then we're going to talk, we're going to be introduced to another one. Uh, as well later on. So let's look at Sozo real quick in verse Luke, uh, cha Luke chapter 8, verse 12. And as you're searching for it, um, I just want to point out that the different writers use words differently. Um, and some, you know, sometimes it's, it's very similar, but Every author has their own sort of signature, if you will, when they're writing uh, these these books or these these letters. John, the Gospel of in the Gospel of John, John uses sozo six times. Matthew and Mark use sozo thirteen times, and Luke uses it the most out of all the gospel writers at fifteen times. So. Uh, Different, different writers will use the words differently. Matthew, as a tax collector, he the first time he uses the word sozo, he's referring to Yeshua um, rescuing or sozoing his you know, Yeshua's people right from their sin. You know, sin is this debt that we couldn't pay back, right? And Yeshua paid it for us. So you have that, that usage, you know, him as a tax collector, you know, collecting debts for the government, and um, you know, Yeshua being the one who is paying that ultimate price so that you can be redeemed, you can be rescued or delivered, okay? Luke, uh, he is going to use it in a couple of different ways, but he primarily uses it... Um, in the form of you know, the second one, to heal or to make well. That's how Luke uses sozo uh, in, his, in his writing of the book, in the Gospel of Luke. So let's look at Luke chapter 8, verse 12, and we'll talk about a complicated usage for this word sozo. And those who by the wayside are the ones who hear, then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts, lest having believed they should be saved. Okay, so this is talking about the, uh, the parable of the sower. 
we understand that the parable of the sower uh, from messages past is the key to understanding the rest of the parables. The, one of the times that Luke uses this word sozo, right? He's talking about, he's saying that Yeshua is saying the seed that falls along the path is the seed that gets scooped up by the devil. And, uh, and Luke adds this one sentence at the end that is not included in Matthew or Mark in reference to this. He says you know, that the, when the, the enemy takes away that seed, which is the word of God, it's, he's, he's taking away the, the person's ability to you know, bring it to mind so that they won't believe and be saved. So he uses sozo in relation to that parable. So hearing the word leads to, and hearing the word and believing it leads to sozo. And the enemy wants to prevent that if he can. Let's look at another, this, this is going to be the more complicated version uh, uh, or not version, the more complicated verse of the two. So let's look at Luke chapter 13, and someone please read 23 through verse 30. And someone said to him, Master, are there few who are being saved? And he said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow gate, because many, I say to you, shall seek to enter in and shall not be able. When once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door saying master master open for us and he shall answer and say to you i do not know you where you are from then you shall begin to say we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets and he shall say i say to you i do not know you where you are from depart from me all you workers of unrighteousness there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham and Yitzhak and Jacob and all the prophets in the reign of Elohim and yourselves thrown outside, and they shall come from the east and the west and from the north and the south and sit down in the reign of Elohim and see there are last who shall be first and there are first who shall be last. Okay, so uh, Luke is using Sozo at the beginning of this passage. And the person is asking the question, are there many who will be, or are there many or few who will be sozo? And if you notice, Yeshua doesn't directly answer the question, yes or no. He, give, he takes a different route, as he often does when he's responding to people's questions. And he takes the response that you need to strive to enter through the narrow gate, because many there are that are looking for it, but few there are that find it. Okay, so, and then he talks about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, right, being in the kingdom, and some of the sons of the kingdom being cast out. So there's a parallel passage to this, and we're going to go there next. Matthew 8, chapter 11, and verse 12. And it's going to give us a little bit more context about what it means to be in, you know, in the kingdom, as Luke is describing it, versus um, you know, being cast out you know, into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. So let's look at Matthew chapter 8, verses 11 and 12, and then we'll just kind of dissect those together. I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Okay, so we talked last week about how there's a paradigm, right? And religion has the paradigm that it's all or nothing. You're either saved or you're not saved, and there's no in-between stage, and that is sort of the trend that, I am, uh, th th that I'm trying to challenge, if you will, in the sense that it's not, it's not all or nothing. And so with that all or nothing mentality, what you have to say is that the outer darkness is referring to a place of eternal punishment. I don't believe that's the case, and uh, I, I started making that case last week, and we'll get into it some more this week. Okay, so Luke's talking about the same thing that Matthew's talking about, but just like in Luke, how he adds a little bit at the end of his uh, parable of the sower about the seed um, being used and necessary for uh, 
believing and being saved. Matthew has this little bit about the table, right? They both talk about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob being in the kingdom, but Luke isn't talking about a table, but Matthew is. So what table might Yeshua be referring to when he's talking about the kingdom? Any guesses? Wedding feast. The wedding feast? Okay. So where would, this, where would this table, where would this wedding feast be taking place in the kingdom? The inner court. The, so this, you've got the outer court. It's, it's taking place in the holy place. Yeshua is referring, to, I believe Yeshua is referring to the table of showbread. That's where, that's where you're going to come in and recline and, and eat, right? It's the, it's the most popular table, if you will, in Israelite culture. So I think that's what Matthew is alluding to, and I think that's what Luke is sort of also alluding to without providing that extra detail. When he's talking about in the kingdom, he's talking about that holy place or that, you know, this, this house, right? It's called a house. This is the outer courtyard, right? And uh, pretty much any Israelite has access to this outer courtyard because you are in covenant with God. That's, uh, if you guys remember months and months ago when we talked about the fear of the Lord, summing up the fear of the Lord, it's being in covenant with God. Being in covenant is essential. You have to be in covenant with him to be able to enter into the outer courtyard. All right. So who, uh, it, according to the Old Testament, who uh, within Israelite culture has access to the holy place? Priests. The priests. Yes, absolutely. Are Levites priests? Yes. Yes and no. Right. You have to. You have to be a, 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 from the tribe of Levi, to, right, to be, to, be, uh, to be a helper, to be in this temple, right? Aaron is also a son of Levi, but a priest is not the same as a Levite, right? So the other families of Levi, if you weren't descended from Aaron, this was as far as you could come. You couldn't enter into the holy place. You weren't allowed. You weren't allowed to enter into the holy place. Only the sons of Aaron. Okay? So the Levites had the same level of access as the, uh, the everyday you know, Israelite, if you will. They came in, and they could go to the bronze altar and the laver and be in the outer courtyard. That's as far as they could go in terms of the level of intimacy that they had with their God and king. What does... Yeah, what does God tell Moses he wants the people of Israel to become? He wants them to be a kingdom of what? Priests. Of priests. Why does he want them to be a kingdom of priests? So that they can have access with him in the house. Because the outer courtyard is not the same as the house. Right? In order to enter in the courtyard, you have to be in covenant. But in order to enter into the house, you have, to be, uh, fr you have to be a priest. And so God is wanting the nation of Israel, God, which you know, is the bride. The nation of Israel is the bride of Messiah. It's the bride of God to have fellowship, intimate fellowship with him in his house. Okay? But... <laughs> The, 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 the Levites, they don't have the same level of access. Even though they're in covenant, they don't have the same level of access. Their job is to assist the priests in carrying out the duties uh, of the temple. You know, they, they're, they're fixing things, they're organizing things, they're washing things, they're moving things. Uh, they're, they're helpers and they're essential, but they don't have the same level of access as the priests do. And so what I think Yeshua is referring to in this, you know, with his answer to this question, are there many or few who will be sozo? And he doesn't answer them. He says to strive to enter in through the narrow gate. 
or you know he's he's so if if you've got when you look at the uh, the outline of the temple from scripture, the the main gate right is twenty cubits wide, so it's a much broader gate, and it's you know you you couldn't miss it uh, in terms of you know looking at the rest of the the temple outline because it's the the door is purple it's you know it's red uh, and it's blue right. So it's got all those colors that signify that it, this is the doorway. Okay, this is the entrance into the into the outer courtyard. The rest of the temple, was, uh, the rest of the the curtains, if you will, are white. Those are those are white, and all the colors have meaning and significance. We're not going to dive into those too much. But the same thing is right here. On the door. This door is also made out of purple and red and blue thread. And same thing with the veil. Purple, red, and blue. So you can't, you can't miss it, right? It, it's, it, it's meant to be obvious. This is the doorway. This is the entrance into the place that, that you're either allowed to be into or not allowed to be into. Okay. So I believe that what uh, Yeshua is referring to, like I said, in as far as you know, entering through the narrow gate. He wants folks, he wants people to be that kingdom of priests, to be in this holy place. And there's a door, and it's and it gets shut at some point in time. It will be shut, and uh, that's I mean that's going to be it as far as who is able to go into the house with him. Right, and we we see that alluded to in the parable of the 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 ten virgins, the five wise and the five foolish virgins. We're not digging into that too much because we're trying to stay focused on uh, Sozo and Zoe and the parable of the wedding feast. All right, let's look at John and read chapter fourteen, verse six. Jesus said to him, "I am the way, and the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me." So you have this outer gate that's 20 cubits wide. That's the way, right? Then what, what, what else is true? Yeshua is truth. What else the, uh, does the Bible say is truth? His word, right? Torah, absolutely. That's truth, right? So in order to get into this place, you have to have the way and the truth, right? You have to be in covenant with Messiah. You have to be in covenant with Messiah. It's not, it's not just you know, the Mount Sinai covenant. You need to be in covenant with Messiah. You need to accept him as the way right, to the Father. This is where the Father is. He's in the Holy of Holies. You can't get to him except through the way. Right? And you have to have the truth, right? So those who aren't walking in truth will find themselves on the outside because they didn't, they, they didn't choose to keep God's ways, right? God's coming back for his bride, not a foreign bride. The nation of Israel is the bride. So he's, in, he's only in covenant with one nation out of all the nations. He's only in covenant with Israel. Yes? Um, I really struggled with that growing up um, because I knew of a lot of people, even people that I associated with who were believers, but not walking in the way. And just wondering, like, does this mean they go to hell? Even though they've believed in God and they've done their best to, to live right and, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So I think this gives me like a new way of looking at it because, you know, I really struggle with that at some point. Like, I don't understand, like, why would someone who just doesn't keep the Sabbath, mm -hmm. but she was really like seeking to the best of her ability, you know, right. to serve him, like, why would she end up in hell? So, because growing up, it was kind of that all or nothing type of situation. So then that's why it left so many questions in my mind, like, right. this, it, this doesn't add up. There, yeah, 
I think there's a lot of gymnastics that have to be done in order to justify that all or nothing position. I do, I, but from, from looking at it through this paradigm, that there are different levels, if you will, of, of intimacy. Um, and if you also look at uh, the, the, the original temple, right, you had the Levites that were, uh, they were living all around the temple. And then after that, you had all the nation of Israel. And then after that, you had the mixed multitude. All right. All of that was all part of the same nation. But the further out you were, right, the, the, the less intimacy you had with the king of kings and the Lord of lords. But he wanted Israel to be a kingdom of priests because they're the only ones that have access to the holy place, to the house. So hopefully that makes sense in the, in the broader context. Um, and we'll tackle some more uh, complicated verses, if you will, that deal with the concept of salvation and uh, just kind of dissect them a little bit and see where it falls. Okay? All right. So Yeshua is the way, the truth, and the life. Right? And the, the word there in uh, John 14, 6 is zoe. Right? So John uses zoe uh, a little bit differently than uh, the other gospel writers. So just, I, I did the breakdown with Sozo. I did the same thing with Zo, uh, Zoe. Mark only uses Zoe four times, Luke five times, Matthew seven times, but John uses this word over 35 times. It was like 36 or 37, I think. I lost count. Because some the, sometimes the word appears multiple times in the same verse, but he uses it over 35 times. That's a lot. Right, so we'll, we'll we'll get into how John uses it versus how the other gospel writers use it. Let's look at Matthew chapter seven and read verse fourteen. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Okay, so this the way that Matthew is using it, right, is referring it's referring back to that same story that Luke is telling in chapter thirteen. Narrow is, is, is this way, right, to Zoe. Zoe. I'm probably going to keep butchering the pronunciation. I apologize. <laughs> this is not my area of expertise. I make connections. That's what, that's what I do. All right, let's look at Matthew chapter 18 and read verses 8 and 9. And if your hand or foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away from you. It is better for you to enter into life lame or crippled rather than having two hands or two feet to be thrown into the everlasting fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out and throw it away from you. It is better for you to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be thrown into the fire of Gehenna. This is a much harsher use, right, of, of using this word zoe uh, in terms of what the goal is. Right? Yeshua is saying, if you want to enter into Zoe, you've got to be willing to you know, chop off your hand if it's causing you to sin or pluck out your eye if it's causing you to sin. Is he really talking about you know, physically maiming yourself? I mean, I guess you could debate that. But I do believe he's referring to people uh, in general. If you have an assembly, right? you have an ecclesia, the body of Messiah, right? and you have people that make up this body, if they're going down a path that they shouldn't, and that has the, that has the potential to lead others astray uh, and, and away from, you know, from God, right? You have to be careful what you believe. Just like with the parable of the sower, the word of God is giving uh, birth to these wheat that's going to be harvested into the barn, that, but there are also the tares that are being sown as well. So you have to be careful with what you believe because what you believe can either keep you on that path to, to Zoe or it can lead, sometimes it can lead you so far off the path, depending on what it is, it can lead you into hell. And so uh, one of the courses of action is to, you know, excommunicate the person from the body, right? Ex exclude them from the assembly so that they don't, continue to infect the body as a whole, right? Yes? 
have a question. Um, we, we, you did say that it could be symbolic. So I'm just thinking, if you've done the study already or thought about it, could the eye, the foot, the hand represent something specific? But of course, at that time, they know exactly what that means. When you say cut off your foot, they know exactly what that means. Uh, well, I would say yes and no. Some of them probably knew what it meant and others didn't. Just like with Yeshua, when he was gaining in popularity, he's like, I don't want people following me just because it's the popular thing to do. So he decides to give a hard message. Unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you have you know, no part in eternal life. Right? And that caused many people to go away because according to Torah, right, you, you, you can't drink the blood, right? That's, that was forbidden. That's an abomination. Uh, that's, that was the covenant that uh, Yahweh made with Noah. You know, don't drink the blood. And so this saying that Yeshua gave uh, wasn't fully understood by everybody. So I don't think that everybody understood what he was meaning specifically uh, for you know, the hand and the foot or the eye. Some probably did. I think Paul understands this because when Paul is talking to um, one, one of the churches that <clears throat> in, in his letters, he's talking about, you know, not all of us are hands, not all of us are feet, not all of us are eyes or ears. Um, shall, you know, shall we say, you know, you know the foot to the, the, the hand, you know, because you're not a, you know, because I'm not a hand, I'm not a part of the body. You know, that's, that's not the case, right? Um, <clears throat> we need all the different parts of the body to, to work um, to its, you know, to its full capacity. So I think that's more or less what he's referring to. So to answer my question, just so, just so I'm clear on what the answer is, because it was a dual question. So number one, are there specific, could there be specific meanings of those words, you know, I guess based on how they were used or something? Um, and I understand the fact that it could still be a hidden meaning. Yeah. But I'm just wondering, are there like specific? Uh, that would probably require an additional, an additional study. I haven't done um, the research into those, that particular lane. Perhaps we could revisit that in a, in a, in a future message. Um, okay, so then let's move on to Matthew 19 and read verses 16 through 20. And behold, a man came up to him saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, which ones? And Jesus said, You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witnesses. Honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, All these I have kept. What do I still lack? And Yeshua said to him, If you will be perfect, go, sell what you possess, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. So we've talked about this in, uh, uh, sort of at length in previous messages, right? The, the rich young ruler goes away sad <clears throat> because he's very wealthy. But he's asking, what good deed must I do to inherit Zoe? Not Because you know, he's already in covenant. He's already in covenant. He's already been uh, delivered, if you will. He's looking for Zoe, the, the fullness, right? The zenith, the, the best that, that God has to offer his people. He's looking for that. And Yeshua tells him, you know, hey, keep the commandments, right? Huh, okay. So I've done that. All right. So what, do, what does he still lack? And that particular individual was lacking care and compassion for his fellow man. It's not just about you and what you can do for yourself. What can you also do for others? That is the purpose of the bride. That is the purpose of the nation of Israel. The ultimate purpose of the nation of Israel was to be a help, a helper, right? An azer to God, 
you know, he's help, he's, Israel is helping God, but how is Israel helping God? With the other nations. Trying to draw them back into fellowship. Trying to draw them back into closer relationship with the one true God. That's the ultimate mission that Israel had. And for a long time, they were too busy worrying about themselves. Keeping the light to themselves. Not wanting to share. Not wanting to evangelize. Not wanting to uh, fulfill the mission that God had for them. They did eventually catch on uh, to this mission. As uh, I've mentioned before, Yeshua tells them, you know, you'll go over land and sea to try to make one convert, but then you make him twice a son of hell as yourselves, right? You're not teaching them my ways. You're teaching them traditions of men. You're teaching them your ways. Give them my Torah. Give them my covenant. Introduce them to, you know, to me. Not the version that you created me to be. All right. So then let's look back at uh, Matthew. Let's look at 19, verse 29. All right. So the disciples say, wow, you know, so who can be sozo? Right. The rich young ruler is asking for zoe. And Yeshua is saying it's really hard to enter into that way. Just like earlier in uh, Luke and Matthew. Narrow is is the way, right? Um, strive to enter in through the narrow gate. Uh, so who can be sozo, right? It, it, he, he leaves it, he, he doesn't answer it directly, right? He's just kind of telling you how he sees the kingdom because he wants people to want to be with him, not, uh, not just a head knowledge. He wants true fellowship, true intimacy. All right, so let's look at 1929. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. So that word, you know, inherit eternal life is, ta- is zoe. It's ta- that's zoe. Um, and he says, you know, if you've left you know, all these things for my sake, you're going to receive a hundredfold. I don't think that number is just thrown out there willy-nilly. I think he uses that intentionally. And it's referring back to the parable of the sower. Some of those seeds are going to produce a crop, 30, 60, a hundredfold. I think it's 30, 60, a hundredfold. 30, 60, a hundredfold. Okay, let's take a look at how Luke uses this term zoe. Let's look at, uh, Luke uses it a little bit different. Matthew and Mark use it pretty much the same in the same stories. Luke uses it a little bit different. He uses it in the similar stories, but then he's also got a couple of other ones that are unique to him. So let's look at 1215. And he said to them, mind and beware of greed because one's life does not consist in the excess of his possessions. You know, Yeshua is gaining in popularity. He's given a great message. And somebody from the crowd says, hey, teacher, you know, tell my brother to split the inheritance with me. And, you know, you, you, he's like, am, am I, have I been made a judge over you? You know, you know one's zoe is, does not consist of the abundance of their possessions. So he's using it in a different way. He's using it in the terms of you could have zoe here and now, in some sense. You live, live your best life now, kind of deal. Right? Let's look, how, how does he use it in 16, verse 25? But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner are bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. Mm. So, remember that in your Zoe, In your lifetime, you had good things. But Lazarus, bad things. And now he is comforted, and you are in anguish. So Luke uses the way in a slightly different way, but it helps us get a different perspective on it. In some sense, you can have Zoe in this lifetime. But what, what, what did uh, 
the rich guy get in, in, the, in the, the world to come, right? What, what, it, what was his lot after that? It was anguish. It, it, it reminds me of what, you know, how Matthew was referring to um, you know, the, the, it, with, with Yeshua's story about tithing and fasting and uh, doing, these, you know, doing good things you know, to be seen right? and praying out loud to be seen. Yeshua tells them, you know, very, he tells them flat out, don't disfigure your face. Don't, you know, go throwing money into the thing to be seen by men, right? Don't be making loud prayers to be seen and thought of well by men in this life because when you do that, you already get your reward in this life, All right? So you can, you can sum it up. And if you do God's things, man's ways, you're going to get man's reward. But if you do God's things God's ways, you're going to get God's rewards. Go into your prayer closet, right? Do it in secret so that the one who sees in secret will reward you openly. In the beginning of this story, right, this rich, young, this rich man that uh, you know, is now in anguish, he, it, it tells you he was clothed in purple. He was, he was royalty. He ate delicacies you know, you know, all of his days. So he's, he's living, he, he lived his best life on this side of eternity. But he had no care and concern for his fellow man. He was in covenant. He was in covenant, but he didn't live like it. He didn't live with the fear of the Lord because in Torah it tells you to take care of the poor to take care of the orphan, to take care of the widow. He didn't do that. He hoarded it all and kept it all to himself. And so he received his reward in this life. And then in the, in the life to come, that was, he, he was left out, if you will. But Lazarus, you know, who had a lot of you know, bad luck, if you will, in this life, inherited good things. He was comforted in Abraham's bosom. The, so, just a little bit of different take on how Luke uses Zoe. It's not just about you know, the world to come. You could have, in some sense, Zoe in this lifetime. And do we not see that, in some sense, in our, in our world today, where people are living their best lives now, but Maybe, maybe not in the kingdom to come, in the life to come. I don't know about you guys, but I would much rather live my best life in the age to come, in the time to come. All right, so let's look at John 1, verse 4. This is the first time that John, in his writings, uses the word zoe. So how does he use it? It's unique, it's unique to him in his writing style. So let's look at John 1.4. In him was the life, and the life was the light of men. So he's saying right, that in Yeshua was Zoe, and his Zoe was the light of man. So he's referring to Zoe as, as Yeshua. That's the first time he uses it, and that's the context that he uses it in. And John is referring to Zoe as in, in some sense, he's referring to Yeshua directly as Zoe. He has it. He is it. It's within him. It is him. Okay? Now, let's look at John chapter 3 and read 14 through 17, right? 16 in there is probably the, one of the most quoted Bible verses uh, in all of the Bible. Uh, but we need a little bit fuller context. John uses this word zoe, but he also uses the word sozo. It's one of the few times he does use the word sozo. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, 
but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is, this is very deep. Yeah, like three, three times or whatever, he's using the word zoe, and then one time he's using the word sozo. Okay, so just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert so that if you looked on it, right, you would be healed, okay, you, so also the Son of Man must be lifted up so that, all, so that all those who turn and look to Yeshua will have Zoe, so that they will have Zoe. Right? For God so loved the world, right? So now he's now he's there's a little bit of a separation there. Okay? Because only only Israel was in in uh, being referred to with the, the the Moses and the serpent, right? Only Israel is being referred to in that instance. But now he's kind of broadening it. And he's saying that God so loved the whole world, not just the nation of Israel, but he loved the whole world. So that, you know, he sent his son so that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have Zoe. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but so that the world might, through him might be sozo. The world at large, those, even though he's not necessarily fully in covenant with all of the other nations, he still cares for the other nations. He still cares for the people of the other nations. Why? He's the creator. He created each of us. He created each and every single one of us. Right? So God is not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to, to repentance. That's, that, is his, that is his heart. That is what he's desiring. But the, the world is going to be sozo through him okay so you have it's it uses that word through right if, if you're going through something is that your final destination no no there's there's still something else on the other side of that through okay that's that you're hoping to get to what did Luke and Matthew and, and, and Mark say? That many, I tell you, will come from east and west and north and south and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But some of the sons of the kingdom will be thrown out. Many people, are, you know, they're, you know, they're, they're going to they're gonna make their way in here, but not everybody who was in covenant accepted Messiah. Who does the dragon go to make war with? The woman's seed, right? And who is, who is that? Those who keep the commandments and, have, and bear the testimony of Yeshua. You need both to enter into here. You need both to enter into here. Okay? It's that level of intimacy. It's a deeper level of intimacy. The world is going to be rescued or delivered through Yeshua. He didn't, come, you know, he didn't come to condemn them. He came to save them. He came to deliver, to rescue them. Let's, let's move. Does everybody have a full grasp of, how, of, of John 14 through 17? It's a, okay. Let's move on then. A little, little bit further on in chapter 3, uh, verse 36. How does John use Zoe? Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. All right, so both of those words, life, is zoe. So just like in, in uh, 3, yeah, 3, 16 and 17, just that they may have eternal life. Is may have eternal life the same as will have eternal life? No, no, it is not. So you could, you could stop if you chose. You could stop on this part of the journey. You're still in the kingdom, but you stopped, right? So you had the option, right? If you had continued to pursue it, right? If you had overcome, all right? But if you, if you stay stuck, but you, you know, 
you just can't get over whatever it is you, you know, you're stuck in. Yeah. And, and just uh, learning this concept, it, it kind of shed highlights on, you know, there's many people I've heard say, I just want to make it. Yeah. And you, you know, you refer to the scripture, the least and the greatest. Right. And it kind of highlight, you know, where one would rather be versus, you know, thinking that getting in is acceptable, but right. you can be far off. Right. Not into the most inner court. Right. Because this is harder. This is harder. Yeshua says it's harder to get here, right? Because you need, you need both keeping the commandments and bearing the testimony of Yeshua. You're not saved by works. You're saved by God's grace. You're, this is how you get in, right? It's grace to get you into here. And some of us, in the, 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 the concept that we can't please God is, I think, ludicrous. How many people have children in this room? Pretty much all of us have children in this room. <laughs> when your children listen to you, are you not well pleased with them? When they don't listen to you, are you frustrated with them? <laughs> but you still love them, right? Right? You still love them, but you can either be well pleased or frustrated and just like, Man, I just want to knock you upside the head. Get it right. right. You, know? you know? So that they can, you, you want them to get it right. You want them to be well-pleasing. That's what... That knows what reward you have for them, basically. Absolutely. Yeshua knows what he has for you, what he wants to give each and every one of us. But he also knows that not everyone is going to choose it. Not everyone is going to choose it. So does that mean you're out because you didn't choose... You know, the, the closest level of intimacy? I don't think so. That doesn't line up with a merciful God. You do all these other things. I don't think it, it lines up with a merciful God. And as we progress through this concept and this way of thinking, I think it'll bear out. I think it'll bear out. Okay, so... If you see, uh, so let, read 36 again, because he uses it in two different ways. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of Yahweh remains on him. So you have believe receives eternal life. Believing in him gets you zoe. But whoever does not obey, whoever does not obey, does not get Zoe because the wrath is still on him. You have to believe and obey. This is believing. This is this is you know, this is obeying and believing, right? You you can't you 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 can't have that close level of intimacy with with him without believing that he is and obeying. Oh. It's kind of like knowledge and wisdom, basically. You can have all the knowledge, but the wisdom that, you know, don't lead you to, you know, that said my people perish for lack of knowledge, but then that wisdom actually brings right. you over. Right, because wisdom is knowledge rightly applied. You have to know how to rightly apply it. How do you rightly divide the word of God? Absolutely. Yes? And I think that, you know, we've talked about this before, the, the notion of believing and, you know, a lot of people believe that, sorry for using the same word, a lot of people have this notion that once you believe, that's it, oh, I'm a believer, oh, I believe in God, but it's important to have the action behind that, which is the obedience. Right. Now, when it comes to being a believer, I love to keep hammering this over and over, that if you, if you believe in Yahweh, that's different from just being aware of Him. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where a lot of people get it mixed up too because they think oh i i believe in god and so even the demons believe Ex exactly and tremble exactly so there's like a difference between being a believer and being just believing that he exists right it's different yeah right w one has you actively walking along the path the other one the other way has you stuck and you know with religion they get you in the door, and they stop you right here. Right. 
You, you don't. Here. You don't have. Yeah, that's right. You made it. Good job. You don't have to do anything else. Technically, I mean, I guess you could say you're right. You don't have to do anything else. You're in there, but that you know, is that all you want? Is that all you want? So you have the bronze altar, right? That's where you know you had the sacrificial lamb. That's you know, Yeshua is that sacrificial lamb. He's paid all of the. He's paid the price for all of your sins, not some, but all of them. And then after that, you have the laver, the bronze laver. That's where you, you know, the the priests were to wash their hands and feet. So maybe there's a connection there. You know, they had to wash their hands and feet before they could go into the holy of the holy place. Right. Leaving is an action. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's there's there's actions behind it. I I tell I, I tell my children, um, you know, you can say you love me all day long, but if you're not doing anything to prove it, if it's just words only, it's harder to believe you. It's much harder to believe you. You know, it just makes me ponder on the idea that you know you you see many followers who basically have been misled to believe that if you just confess your sin and believe, you know, you will be saved. But there's a whole gamut of extra that one would have to continue to do, mm -hmm. living the life uh, within his will. Um, but it's, it's not that simple. There's conditions or contingencies just believing and having faith. There's, it's a process, right? The first thing on the way is justification. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you'll by no means inherit Zoe, right? So whose righteousness? It's not our righteousness. It's Yeshua's righteousness. That's what gets us, you know, into, into this eternal uh, life, into this eternal covenant with God. It's his righteousness. And then after that, justification Right After that initial justification, there is the process of sanctification. And what is sanctification? It's the process of being made holy. 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 Right? It's, it's a process. It doesn't just, you know, boom, transactional, now you're done, don't ever do, do anything again. Uh, we see in the, in the prophets that if something that is sacred, some of it is holy, has been used in a profane way, and profane is another way of saying common, a common way. If you use something that was meant to be holy, set apart in a common way, it no longer remains holy. It's got to go back through a sanctification process. So yes, we can have setbacks in this life. We can absolutely have setbacks in this life. That doesn't mean that God's given up on you, right? He's the God of second chances. He, he loves his people. He wants to save his people. He, you know, he, he wants to have intimacy with his people. But he also knows that not every single person is going to choose him. Unfortunately. Um, so you need that belief and, you know, with that obedience to get you into this you know, higher level of intimacy. All right. Let's look at John chapter 4, verse 14. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So that water that gets inside of you will become like a spring you know, leading to eternal life. So it's kind of, you have, you have Yeshua who is Zoe, right? Who has Zoe. He gets inside of you, right? You accept him into your heart, right? You have him in your heart. And what do we get when we accept Yeshua as our Lord and Savior? We get the gift of the Holy Spirit, who's the spirit of truth, who's leading us into all truth. The spirit of truth is leading us into all truth. He's leading us into truth. We, and it's be, it be, has the potential to become that fountain that leads to Zoe. So I'm, I'm pausing. Hopefully it, it's, it's resonating. <laughs> I don't know. There's a lot of silence in the room. It's either going really well or really bad. Uh, okay, let's look at John chapter 5 and read verse 24 and 26. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me possesses everlasting life and does not come into judgment, 
that has passed from death into life. For as the Father possesses life in himself, so he gave also to the Son to possess life in himself. All right, so you have this, you know, I, 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 it, I, feel, I feel like a broken record, right? But uh, <laughs> saying, saying things over and over again. But so John, you know, he, he uses, uses it slightly different in this sense. He's referring back to that first, you know, one verse four, right? In him was life and the life was the light of all men, right? So just as the father has Zoe in himself, so also he is given to the son to have life in himself, uh, that can be, I guess, a little bit confusing. Um, but just trying to you know, wrap our minds around the concept that Yeshua is Zoe. He has it, right? And he and the Father are one, right? They are, they are one in the same. He is the, you know, Yeshua is the imprint of, of the invisible God. So you have to believe in him, right, to have Zoe, that possibility. You have to believe in him to have the possibility of Zoe. That's why even if you're an Israelite, you're in covenant, you're in the outer courtyard, and you think that by having this covenant with God that you're going to be in here in the kingdom to come. But many, he says, Matthew and Luke both say, many of the sons of the kingdom are going to be thrown out where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth because they don't have... Yeshua. They don't have Yeshua. Yeshua is Zoe. They, they have the obedience, but they don't have the life, right? They don't have Yeshua. So back to Luke uh, in, in Acts. You know, Luke uses, you know, Luke wrote the book of Acts. So how does he use it in the book of Acts? This is a different letter written at a different time. Verse, uh, sorry, chapter 11. Verse 18. Having heard this, they were silent and praised Elohim, saying, Then Elohim has indeed also given to the nations repentance unto life. Repentance unto Zoe. He's given to the nations, he's given to the Gentiles the possibility to come from east and west, north and south, to enter into Zoe. This was an impossibility in their mindset before, before this time, right? They thought it was meant for themselves alone. But Yeshua had a different plan in mind. He's always had this plan, this, the, this plan of redemption for all people, the possibility to redeem all people, to enter into Zoe, to enter into the ultimate you know, intimacy and fellowship with the one true God. The fact that other that Gentiles were able to be, uh, you know, were, were receiving messages right from from angels from from Yeshua and you know being baptized and and not only being baptized with water but being baptized with the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, other languages, right, was proof to the disciples at that time that God truly has opened the door for all nations to come in to receive Zoe. They don't have to just, they're, they're not stuck out here just because they, they were born from somebody different, right? It's an equal playing field. You still have to assimilate, though, into the nation. You still have, the bride has to adapt herself, has to assimilate, has to understand the ways of her groom. The bride is Israel. There's only one bride. The people of the ecclesias, right? We make up the nation of Israel. There's only one, there's only one bride. Okay, so it's opening up for the Gentiles. Uh, Acts chapter 13, 44 through 48. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowd, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, said, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you, since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy 
of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Amen. Amen. So some of the religious leaders, right, and, and you know, uh, they, they, they were jealous that, that Paul was getting more attention with the words of Yeshua, right, with the gospel, with the gospel, than they were getting Right with the way that they had, you know, with their traditions of men, and Paul, you know, uh, he he tells it like it is. You guys are judging yourselves unworthy of Zoe. You guys are judging yourselves unworthy of it because you cast it aside. You don't want it. You're saying you're not. You're saying you're not worthy of it, and I think that's where a lot of people they can fall into that trap because the enemy, the accuser, right? If you're, in a, if you're a child of God, he can't do anything to you to get you out of the kingdom, right? But perhaps if he's crafty enough, he can convince you of some things to, to keep you back from what God has in store for you. Or even worse, perhaps he can convince you to renounce citizenship because it's just too hard to be saved. And I think that's what we get when, when scriptures say it's impossible to please him after tasting or coming into the goodness or the knowledge. Of You're right. He, yeah, Hebrews. Back right. Into that way of living again. Right. Well, that, that is a verse that we're going to have to tackle next week. I intended to try and get to it this week, but the deeper I dove into this concept, the more it's like, okay, we need to develop uh, this concept more uh, before getting into these other you know, more difficult passages that deal with uh, salvation. <clears throat> so uh, that's what we're doing. All right. You can curse yourself. You can. But he can't do it. The adversary can't do anything to you. But he can cause you to do it to yourself. Right, right. I mean, it, it makes me think of uh, the, uh, and I know it was a book first, but uh, the movie Pilgrim's Progress. There's a cartoon version. My, my children love watching it. Um, and in the Pilgrim's Progress, there's a, uh, a realm, a kingdom, right, uh, of desperation. And so the, the, the two protagonists, they're, you know, taken, uh, they're taken captive by a giant and put into like a bird cage, but for, he, but for people. And he gives them all kinds of weapons and, you know, leaves them for six days and then comes back and says, well, you're still alive. I gave you everything you needed to do the job, right? And they're just like confused. The, the two protagonists are confused. They don't know what the heck is going on other than the fact that they're in this giant bird cage and they feel like they're going to die anytime because below them are bones of other beings who had been in that cage or been in that realm and didn't make it out. So they're like, oh man, it's just a matter of time before we experience the same fate. But the giant, you know, he gets himself so riled up, he ends up passing out. And then, you know, the wife comes in and, you know, is just kind of bewildered that she, that, that they're still alive also and that her, you know, giant husband is on the floor passed out again. And, you know, she gets upset and, you know, you know, shakes the cage kind of deal, and, uh, you know, then picks up her husband and goes away. And the two protagonists are like, man, she, uh, she, she could, you know, she could surely destroy us if she wanted to. But one of them, you know, he has this, this realization, she can't. And the other guy's like, what are you talking about? She's, she could crush us with her fingers. Like, we're so small compared to her, she could crush us between her fingers. And he's like, that's just it. She can, but she can't. What did the other giant say? I gave you everything you needed to do the job, right? They can't kill you, but they can make life so miserable for you that you want to do it yourself. You can curse yourself, right? You can take your own life. The enemy only has so much authority over you, right? And when you submit to Yahweh, when you submit to Yeshua, right, you, you are a child of the king. So all these other realms that have dominion over their citizens, they don't have dominion over you. But they can perhaps make you think that they do. If they can convince you long enough, if you listen to them long enough, 
And many people do that, unfortunately. So there's this, you know, this, this idea that they, they, they have some you know, abilities, but they don't have authority over you. But they're hoping, they're trying everything they can to get you off of the path and to get you to give in to keep you from getting what God has in store for you. You can self-destruct. They're hoping you will self-destruct. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. He self-destructed, didn't he? Couldn't curse the people. Right. Because, which is, which is mind-boggling, right? Because Israel, you know, they weren't perfect, but God had judged them as being perfect, right? They were, they were within his covering, right? So Balaam, you know, can't curse what God has blessed, right? Yeah, absolutely. But he gives advice to get Israel to come out from underneath that covering. Perfect correlation. Mm. Perfect. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, come on out. It's great out here. And next thing you know, there's you know they're dying by the thousands. Yes. Um, as you were speaking, what came to mind is that is people who leave the faith because of something that happened. You know, some relational thing. Either someone said something, someone did something, and it made them feel a way. And then next thing you know, they stop fellowshipping. Next thing you know, they're celebrating Christmas again. <laughs> you know, they've just gone back to what they were doing before. It just made me think of it that it's like if we could actually have our eyes open and see mm -hmm. that these things are intentional, right. not necessarily that that brother is being intentional about taking me down, but the enemy is using right. situations as as a catalyst to get us to fall away and things like that. And if we could just have our eyes open to recognize that there are, there are like <laughs> pitfalls, there are, you know, landmines set up for us, all of these things, you know, people talking about us or people doing things that, you know, you feel they shouldn't have done or whatever, all of that is set up to get us to tell ourselves, eh, later for this, this isn't the right way for me, yeah. oh, this is just, you know, and then you just, it, you'll keep on, the more you start to talk bad about the people or the fellowship or whatever right. is the more it's like the seed keeps growing and right. next thing you know you're you're on your own you're by yourself you're not fellowshipping anymore so i think yeah. it just as you were talking it just came to my mind like you know if we could just open our eyes and see right. that all of those things are just are meant to turn us away right. then we would we would you know build up our reserves and have our weapons ready to fight against them so that we don't self-destruct, right. you know, anyway. Yeah, it's, it's because we wrestle against, you know, principalities, against spiritual forces of darkness and, and wickedness in, in the heavenly realms, right? It's not a war against flesh and blood. You're not at war with the person standing right in front of you. You're at war with the spiritual entity that's behind them, right? Or whispering into them or whatever the case might be, right? It's a, it's a spiritual battle. It is a spiritual battle. And absolutely, I mean, it's constant. It's constant because the enemy doesn't want you here. The enemy doesn't want you to be at peace. The enemy doesn't want you to be helping others. The enemy wants you to be focused on you and how terrible you are and how unworthy you are so that hopefully you'll turn yourself around and stop because it's just too hard to, uh, to go on. Can I add sure. this one last thing? So the other thing I was thinking about is the state that you get where now you're convinced that you're right. You know, you start off like, oh, they're talking about me or they're, I don't know, doing whatever or what, whatever people leave for. They're conspiring for against their, me. Whatever their reasons are, right? And then, so you're in that mode and then you don't feel comfortable, I'm sure. I mean, this is based on conversations that I've had with people that left. You know, you feel this distant feeling, you feel all that. And then you get to the point where you have convinced yourself that I'm right, I'm okay. Yeah, right. Like, yeah. I am right. Like, honestly, those people are misled. They're religious zealots and they're whatever. Mm -hmm. I, I was misled to be worshiping with them. I'm okay. So I feel like that's a danger right. that we all can fall succumb to is that feeling of I'm okay. Yeah. I'm okay like this. I, I, I'm okay. Because, I mean, that's, and that's another self-destructive um, right. 
thing that the enemy puts out there. Right. Just that sense of I'm okay or I'm doing I'm doing great. Even right. though if you're being honest with yourself, there are some things wrong. Right. You know, so that's that just came to my mind as well, just for us to be aware of that, that you know, we should never feel like we've got it all together. Right. Like there should always be a striving to please him, a striving to do things better. And the moment we start to think, oh, I'm good and those people are whatever, trust me, there is something. Even if those people are indeed kind of sucky, but <laughs> <laughs> but there, chances are there's something within us right. that needs to be fixed and we've allowed ourselves to self-destruct by thinking that right. we're okay. Yeah. yeah. So uh, two things come to mind off of that, right? You've got deceiving spirits that exist, right, that can lead you astray. Um, but then you've also got pride. Yes. You've also got pride that is so crafty and disguises itself so well yeah. uh, in, a, in a variety of ways. It's, it's not just, pride isn't just a one-trick pony. It's got a lot of subtleness to it. Um, it can look humble. It can look, you know, certainly like, like, like the humble brag, right? <laughs> uh, I won't give any examples. We're too far off track. But just, you know, pride and deceiving spirits. Okay, let's look at Paul and see how he uses this term zoe. In chapter 5, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 19. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. Okay. So if, if, if Zoe is only in this life, right, then, that, yeah, yeah, then, then we are to be pitied. So he's, he's referring to, the, he kind of uses it the way that Luke uses it, right? You know, this, the idea, this concept that you can have a type of Zoe here and now, but if that's the best that there is, then, then man, we, we, are, we are hurting for certain, right? If there's no Zoe in the life to come, then, then yeah, we deserve to be pitied because we think that there is, right? So don't fall into that trap. Don't fall into that trap. There's, there's more to this life um, than just this life, right? So, uh, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and read verses 8 through 12. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Yeshua may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Yeshua's sake, so that the life of Yeshua also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Okay, so he's using it, he, he's using uh, zoe, but then he also uses a different word that is very similar. Uh, so zo, uh, zoe is Z-O-E in English, and I don't even know how to how would say it, zao, maybe, Z-A-O. Right? So the first time he uses that word, you know, life, uh, he's referring to zoe, right? You know, in Christ, right? So he, now Paul is using it the same way that John uses zoe, that it is, it is in Yeshua, that it is Yeshua, right? And we're trying to manifest that life, that zoe, inside of our hearts, inside of us, Right, and then the, then he uses the term uh, "zao." I'm probably pronouncing that terrible. Um, right, in in the terms of like this physical life that we, are, li we we live and breathe in. Right, so even though we're you know we're living and breathing, okay, we're still looking for you know zoe in the kingdom to come. Right, we're still looking for zoe in Yeshua to be. You know, it, it's the work that's been started in us, but it hasn't been brought to completion yet. It's kind of like the saying, greater is he, Zoe, that lives in us <laughs> right. than he that lives in the world. Right. Zoe. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so now that we, this is not all the times that the word Zoe is used. It's used 134, 135 times in the New Testament alone. <clears throat> um, but hopefully we have a decent grasp 
on how it's used and how it can be used. And we'll go back to Matthew uh, chapter 22, verse 5 through 7, and we'll just kind of wrap it up with these last three sections here. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized the servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry, and he sent his, his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. So this is, you know, you know, bringing it back to the parable of the wedding feast, okay? This is the first judgment, if you will, that's rendered in this parable. You have these people who treated his, the, the master's servants shamefully, who persecuted them, who killed them. <clears throat> and so the master of the house, you know, God, he sends his troops and, you know, destroys the people and burns their city. Okay, um, all right, so that is contrasted with uh, later on in that same parable, Matthew 22, verses 13 and 14. Then the king said to the servant, bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Okay, so it's... It's referring to that same you know, to that same concept, right? That Yeshua, in uh, so th you know, this is the Gospel of Matthew, right? Earlier in Matthew, when he's talking about the faith of the centurion, he's using that concept of e you know, people will come from east and west, north and south, to recline at table, right, with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out, and in that place there will be you know weeping and gnashing of teeth, right? So you have, you have that contrasted with your, you know, being destroyed and your city burned with fire. Okay? So it's, it's this concept, right? I, I think that they are all tied together. They're all linked. It's all trying to say the same thing, that just because you're in covenant with, with you know, God, right? If you don't have Yeshua, you're in the wedding feast without a garment on. You're not in the right clothing because your righteousness didn't exceed that of the Pharisees. You're using your own righteousness, which isn't good enough for, for, for this. It's not, it's not good enough. If, if all you've got is, is obedience, but you don't have faith, then you don't have Zoe. That you get, you get kicked out of the house. You're still in the kingdom, but you, you've been kicked out of the house. You're no longer, uh, you, you no longer have access to the king of kings, right? That you thought you did. Okay. So let's, let's look at this concept of, you know, these people who are, you know, treating people shamefully, you know, persecuting them, killing some, and uh, having your, you know, their city burned with fire. Let's look at the next chapter, chapter 23, and read verses 37 through 39. Who is this city? Who are these people? O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stone those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So Jerusalem is the city that persecuted the prophets, those who were sent to her. Jerusalem is the one whose city is going to be burned with fire. And it was burned with fire in 70 AD, right? God said, Yeshua said, I, how often I wanted to gather you together, but you were not willing. One of the parables that we talked about previously, the parable of... Uh, the, the minas, right? It's, you know, con it's, it's contrasted with the parable of the, of the talents. The minas, what was the thing that, what was one of the things that was unique about the parable of the minas is that the people of this, uh, of, you know, that belonged to this king that was going to go and get a kingdom, they sent a delegation after him saying, we don't want you to rule and reign over us. But he gave money to his servants. And when he comes back, he's going to settle accounts with his servants. 
and he settles accounts with his servants, but then afterwards he says, what he, he, he pronounces another judgment, right? So there's a different judgment. There's a judgment, you know, settling accounts for the servants. Some of them, you know, did really well, right? Their five minus, or their, their one mina made ten minas. Their one mina made five minas. And then the other guy, the last guy, didn't do well at all. He just buried it. He just, he stayed stuck. He stayed stuck. He doesn't get to enter into the holy place. He gets stuck out here. But those citizens of mine who did not want me to rule over them, what does he say? Bring them here and slaughter them before me. Same thing about the wedding, uh, the parable of the wedding feast. So there's a difference. There, there is a difference in, uh, in judgment. There is a difference in reward. And that was uh, what I wanted to cover uh, today in this message. Hopefully, um, hopefully you can kind of see where I'm coming from and maybe you know, dwell on it some more yourselves. Think, of, think it over, pray about it, see what you think. Um, to me, this makes more sense looking at it from the kingdom lens than looking at it through uh, religious eyes. So I think it has more answers. We just have to look at it through the right lens and you know, figure out where the pieces need to fit. And I think all the pieces mesh really well uh, and you know, form a, a, a beautiful and also intimidating tapestry because there is still judgment. There's just different, different kinds. So uh, are there any other questions or thoughts on things that we've covered? You sure? We haven't covered it yet. You said things that we've covered. OK, OK. I'll wait. I'll wait. The only thing is that um, I have different accounts of the, you know, the apostles and how they interacted with the understanding mm -hmm. of the Zoe and the Sozo. Sozo. Yeah, so, Sozo. Yeah, I think that's how you pronounce that. John seemed to me, I don't know, um, kind of more in debt as far as the Zoe. Yes. Yeah. He, he's, he definitely is primarily concerned with Zoe as opposed to Sozo. Right. That's that's his focus. That's the focus of his letter. But what's and that that to me makes a lot of sense, because in his own gospel, he's referring to himself as the best man of the groom. Who's 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 the other character? The bride. Right. So it's the gospel for it's the good news for the bride. This is, it, this is a letter specifically for the bride. Um, <clears throat> and John also wrote the book of Revelation. Sozo is not in the book of Revelation. He does not use it one time, but he uses Zoe a lot. He uses it a lot. So it's, he, he is primarily focused on the bride. Right? The, other, the other three gospel writers, you know, they, they're a little bit more balanced between you know, uh, the, the bride and also the, uh, the Gentiles, the other, the other nations out there. And same thing with Paul. Paul uses Zoe and Sozo. So, well, do you, so if it's not on something that we've covered, is it still related to this or? Uh, it's related. Okay, well then go for it. Sure no, go for it. So do you believe that there will be some people that go to hell? I do. Oh. I do. Okay. So I don't know who. And that's the other side of, of, of the coin, right? The, um, uh, the, I guess I think it's probably the second most quoted Bible verse in the whole Bible is judge not lest you be judged, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Let, yeah, right? Right? Because with the measure you use, it'll be measured to you. But Paul says, you know, don't you? Know, you should be judging outward matters, right? If they're doing things like, you know, in, in the Corinthians, letters of the Corinthians, if you have a guy taking his father's uh, wife as his, you know, and going into her, that's something that's not even done among the Gentiles. You can't parade that around. You can't promote that. You can't take pride in that. That's an abomination, right? You can't. You shouldn't be doing those things, right? That's on the external. 
right? I think what Yeshua is referring to on this judgment is the internal. Don't you, it's not for you and me to decide and pass judgment. Well, you're so zo, but you're not zoe. Or you're not either of these things. You're going to hell, right? That is not for us because only, only God can judge the heart. We can't judge the heart, but we will be judged for how we judge others. <laughs> That's why, you know, Yeshua tells us, you know, to be careful about judging and, um, you know, with, in the, that warning, because the measure that you use will be measured to you. So you've got to be very careful with how you're, um, you know, with, with, what you're, with what judgments you're, you're, you're making, because it could have an effect on your, your life as well. Yes? And I, th I think we need to get super clear on what is judging, because in this 2023, judging is just speaking against something that you see or something you dis disagreeing is judging. But I really feel like that's not what judging is. And right. so I think a lot of times that the problem that comes in is that people don't understand what a word means. And so when you try to use scripture to back up what you're saying, but it's two different things, then it really doesn't make sense. So give you an example. The Bible says that by their fruit, you shall know them. Right. Right. So obviously, if you see people living a reckless lifestyle, fornicating, doing all the things, right. is, it, is it judging to say they are sinners? That's They're living a sinful me. lifestyle. <laughs> I mean, is, is that a judgment or is that an observation? Right. How about fruit inspectors? Yeah. <laughs> hey. There you go. There you go. I mean, so, you, I right. So you, I think you can it determine, it can be, how bold are you wanting to be with that individual? Because uh, James, James tells us, or not, not James, sorry, Jude, Jude. Uh, at the end of Jude, uh, he's, he's, you know, exhorting the, uh, the, the believers that he's writing to, you know, hey, with some, you know, scare them with hellfire, <laughs> right? Some need that, 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 Bam, hit him in the face, wake up call. Like, dude, if you don't stop, you're going to hell. Other people, that's not going to work for them. So they're going to need a little bit gentler approach. But like, man, I know you're trying to live right. Like you say you're trying to live right. This and this doesn't line up with scripture, you know, in your life. You know, inspecting the fruit, right? You know, you say this about yourself, but what we see is this. Now, are you judging them? I mean, it, you, you can be internally if, if you're not careful, but if you're pointing it out, you know, you're be, you know, being that fruit inspector, maybe that's the thing that, well, you know, wakes them up. Be like, ah, oh, yeah, I, I see what you're, what you're saying. I am kind of living, you know, you know, not in character with what the Bible says. I think, I think you're right about that, but I also think that, again, that whole notion of judging, judging, you're passing a sentence on someone. Right. So I think that if you if you if, if you admonish someone, right. you know about you know what you see happening to them or what, or what you think you see because sometimes you think you see something and you're wrong. You know right. you have a conversation about something someone about their lifestyle or whatever. I don't think that's judging. I think it's when you're like you're gonna you're gonna burn in hellfire because you right. didn't do this or oh look at those people they're gonna whatever like to me to me and right. so I'm. I want to say it openly, so if someone wants to correct me, that's great. You know, I, I feel like judging means to pass judgment. Sentence. So, yeah. so it's a sentence on yeah. the person. And that's where it comes, like, really iffy because, right. you I, know, who are you, who are you to pass a sentence on someone? Because, honestly, right. today I could be cussing and acting a fool, and tomorrow I could be heavily convicted of my ways and surrender and repent and just... Right change so who are you to say because you saw me today and i i was a reveler that tomorrow you know that i should yeah. go to help you know who right. are you to say that i think that's so, right. the misunderstanding of today's today's misunderstanding of the word judgment they correlate it to passing sentence, sentence right and it's not that at all yeah. exactly so. yeah we're not supposed to be passing sentence you know we can be fruit inspectors we can uh you can call out injustice. Yeah, absolutely. You can call out things that are anti, 
the right. word or Christ, whatever, I, right. I, I don't see anything wrong with that. I agree with that. And at the same time, we can't judge the heart. Only, only God knows the heart. So only God is the one that gets to decide who ends up where. So, so yeah. with that being said, would you say the bride, on the three levels you have there, would you say the bride is only selected from the truth section? Or Yes. Yeah? Yes. Because you have, so you have, you have the, um, you know, in the parable of the wedding feast, you have, you know, the, the, the master of the house is inviting people to come to the, 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 the wedding feast, right? So who's, so who's involved there? You have the, the, the king, right? You have the one who's getting married, the groom, right? So you've got the father and God the son, same thing, right? Um, but then you also have the bride. So he's, he's getting married to who? And then what, what do you have in, in a wedding feast, right? You have guests. You have witnesses. You have those who are bearing witness that these two are indeed in covenant. And so... <clears throat> I think, you know, if we follow the pattern of Scripture, right, the tithes, tithes and offerings, okay, the tithes was, was required, okay, offerings was free will, gift offerings, okay, so how, what percentage was the nation of Israel required to tithe to the Levites? What percentage? Ten percent, right? So... What percentage of what the Levites got were they required to tithe to the priesthood? Yeah. Same. Same, 10%. So you have 10% of 10%. So you have 1%, right? Essentially, of the whole, it's 1%. So I think of the 10% that, that is the nation of Israel, right? Only some, of, only some of those are like, like the closest level that you can absolutely get with, uh, with Yahweh, right? Um, you still have, you have sons of the kingdom, right? That's, a, that's a, a phrase that's used. It's a term that's used in uh, Revelation quite a bit. Um, but Yeshua uses it also. Uh, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. It, it, if you're familiar with uh, some of the stuff that we've talked about, and gosh, it's almost been a year now, uh, the, who are the sons of God, right? So it's, it's uh, you know, they were divine beings that were given authority to rule over the other nations, the, the other nations, right? You know, Yahweh got Israel and the nation of, you know, the nation of Israel, Jacob, his allotted heritage, right? So then you have the other nations. <clears throat> you have uh, other nations, talked about in the millennial kingdom that are supposed to come for the feast days, right? So you have Israel, but then you also have other nations being referred to in uh, the millennial reign. So who's, ru who's ruling over them? So then also that middle <clears throat> is where everyone is judged. Because otherwise, where would they be cast out from to the, outer, to the courtyard of outer darkness? Perhaps. Yeah. Um, they were brought into truth. Everyone will be brought into truth. And in either they're accepted or they're cast out, correct? Um, I, I, believe that to, I believe that's the case as of right now. I reserve the right to be wrong, and so we can, you know, I definitely intend to you know, dig fuller, you know, dig more fully into this concept, but I do believe that to be the case, because Paul is talking about a judgment seat, right, that, you know, all of us, Paul talks about it, um, I believe it is in Corinthians, uh, yeah, chapter 3, I think, um, how we're all going to be called to give an account, right, for what we've done in the body, right? And, you know, if, you know, you can't lay any foundation other than Messiah, but everybody's work is going to be judged, you know, through fire. And if it's burnt up, you know, the wood, hay, stubble, or straw, then he suffers a loss, but his life is saved, but through the fire. But if it's, you know, gold or silver, then he gets to keep that as a reward. If what you truly did for the kingdom really was motivated to do it for Yahweh, for the kingdom, then those deeds that you did in the body are given to you as a reward to take with you into the kingdom to come. But if you did it for yourself, 
you just looked like you were doing it for the kingdom, that's, you know, that's going to get burned up. That's not going to be respected. And uh, that, is hap- that, that is happening for, you know, that, that's the judgment seat of Messiah. It's rewards and losses. It's not the same, it's not the same judgment that's talked about um, with the, the second resurrection. There's a lot more to dig into it. We're not going to be able to cover it here. We're already way, way over time. But we, I, I, that is where we're going. That is where we're going. As we dig into the parables, the parables are going to help the bride understand her position, her inheritance, and help us understand the dynamics of the kingdom a little bit better, um, and as, as well as you know, the judgments and, and whatnot. So with that, <clears throat> I hope you all got something out of it. And uh, we'll see you all next time. Shabbat shalom.